So what does a decision tree actually do? Let's examine each of the nodes carefully. So if you look at this particular node, 92.5, and what we are saying is there were 1,083 cases where the income was less than or equal to 92,500, and there were 417 cases where the income was greater than 92,500. So at this stage, what the model did was to partition all the cases into two groups. One group which had income less than 92,500, less than or equal to 92,500, and another group which had income greater than 92,500. That's it. They took, we took the entire set of cases that we had, and this node partitions those into two groups. Again, this node takes all the people whose income was greater than 92,500 and further partitions them into two groups based on education. So at the end of this partition, we have three groups of people. This is one group of people whose income was less than or equal to 92,500. And after this division, you've got two more groups of people whose education is less than or equal to 1.5 and education greater than 1.5. So after two divisions, we've got three different partitions and so on. So every time you partition one of the groups that you've got, you're going to have one more new group that is created. So each decision node or interior node partitions its base cases, that is the cases that apply to that particular node, it partitions them into two different sets. So for example, this node partitioned the 417 into 260 and 157, which really adds up to 417. So that's really what's going on in the tree. It is partitioning. Now the reason I'm mentioning this is that this intuition that a tree is essentially doing partition is what we are going to use to actually develop the method that the technique actually uses. Of course, we will discuss the method. You need to understand the method, but you don't really need to carry out the method on paper because we are going to use Rattle to do the job for us. So once again, we are going to illustrate what we are doing with our riding mowers data. By now, you're already familiar with this data. We've got information on income, lot size for a bunch of people. And we also know whether they own a riding mower or not. So this is the complete data set. So in some sense, this is a, a toy data set just used for illustration purposes. So in this case, we will not actually partition the data at all because we have too little data as it is. So we'll just use this data to understand the process of building a tree. We will not validate this model at all. Now, preliminary analysis, we draw the box plots of non-owners and owners by both uh, uh, for both income and lot size. And clearly, as we expect, we find that people who've got higher incomes are more likely to own a riding mower. And people who've got yards which have a higher lot size are also likely, more likely to own a riding mower. So we understand that and we'll jump into the technique now. Okay, so as we've already discussed, a set of rules at each stage partitions the available people in a group into two parts. That we know. But eventually, when once the complete tree is constructed, then what you're really seeing is that the total number of cases, which is 1,083 plus 417, which is 1,500 cases, has been partitioned into all these groups. So if you add up all of these, you should get 1,500. 1,083 plus 0 plus 60 plus 200 plus 130 plus uh, 27. Right? So that is because there are 27 cases here, 130 cases here, 0 cases here, 200 cases here, etc. If you add them all up, you will get 1,500. So really, what the tree is doing is taking all the cases and partitioning it into a set of cases that satisfy each of the rules. And this is a disjoint partition. You know, a particular case can belong to only one of the rules. And together, they consist of all the cases that we started with. So that's really what a set of rules is doing. It is partitioning all the cases into a set of buckets with one bucket for each rule. That's what we are doing here. So. If you, in this example, since we have two dimensions, 
it is easy to look at this on a chart. What we have done here is we have plotted it on a chart. We are showing a scatter plot of income and lot size. And for all the cases, all the 24 cases are actually plotted here. The dark dots indicate that those are owners and the light dots indicate that those are not owners. So clearly you can see that there is a predominant trend for the dark dots to be to the right and to the top indicating higher income and higher lot sizes. That's just the trend. The same information that we saw in the box plot is what you're seeing here. So this is the complete scatter plot of all the cases we have and we are able to do this because we've got only two dimensions. Beyond that we won't be able to visualize it. So we've got this and what we really want to do is to go and partition this because after all we saw that the decision tree partitions the cases again and again and again. So we'll do the same thing. So for example this is an example of a partition and what this partition says is we've drawn a line at 19 on the lot size. So what this line is doing is taking all the cases dividing them into two groups. The first group on top indicates all the cases for income great a lot size greater than 19 that is all those cases and this the lower part consists of all the cases for which the lot size is less than 19. Now incidentally let's just jump back to this case here uh, this slide here so here we are saying all the cases satisfying rule 1 all the cases satisfying rule 2 3 etc now, of course, what we really would like is for all the cases that satisfy a particular rule to be as homogeneous as possible. <coughs> In other words, we want to say a particular rule, you know, income greater than this, credit card average, family size greater than that, education this. Ultimately, once you've reached a decision point, let's say that is rule, uh, rule three. So we've got this here and we would like most of these to fall into one category which is acceptors of the loan or non-acceptors of the loan. There's no point if you had a rule and the cases that satisfied the rule were equally possible to be acceptors or non-acceptors. Then the rule is not really helping us. If you say I apply the rule and 90% of the people who satisfy the rule fall into one category then you can say well that's a useful rule because it helps me to predict something that there's a great likelihood of cases that satisfy the rule to be in this class or in another class. If it's 50-50 or very close to that, then the rule is not really helping us, right? So what we would really like is for the rule to classify all the cases into fairly homogeneous groups. By homogeneous, we mean the group consists of like type of cases, you know, buyers, non-buyers, owners, non-owners, etc. That's really what we are trying to do here. So here, what we have done by doing this partitioning is to divide the whole space into two regions and you notice that both of these regions are now much more homogeneous than was the whole case. In the whole case of course we had 12 owners and 12 non-owners of riding mowers but now if you look at the top region you've got mostly owners that is we have created a fairly homogeneous group. And the bottom region consists of mostly non-owners, another very homogeneous set of groups, right? So that's what we are trying to do here. We want to keep on partitioning the space such that ultimately we end up with partitions that are as far as possible completely homogeneous, okay? So that's really what we did. You can look at the correspondence between what we did here and the decision tree. So here, by putting the partition here, we've created the first branch of our decision tree. That is, we divided this root node on the lot size value of 19 and the cases which are less than or equal to 19 are here and the cases which are greater than 19 are here. So that's the correspondence between what we are doing and the tree itself. So we are really building the tree by doing partitioning. Of course, you might be wondering, how did we do this partition? I mean, why did this fellow pick lot size to do the partition? Why not income? Or, okay, assuming somehow, some logic, he chose lot size. 
why did he choose to put the value at 19? Why not 21? Why not 23? Why not 25? Why not 15? We could have drawn the line anywhere, but I have chosen to draw the line here. Why do you think this is the case? Think a little bit. Of course, you can see that what we are trying to do is to create a bunch of homogeneous regions. That is, regions that predominantly contain one or other type of cases, owners or non-owners in this particular example. And it so happens that drawing the line at 19 is what helps us to create maximally homogeneous regions. For now, just take it as it is. But later on, we'll put a mathematical definition for this. We'll be able to say precisely, this is why these are more homogeneous. We'll put a concrete notion on top of this. That's the idea here, right? So now initially it was 50-50, 12, 12, 12 owners, 12 non-owners. That was the initial case. After drawing the line, we've got one group here. This has got nine owners and three non-owners. And the other group here has got uh, three owners and nine non-owners which is significantly more homogeneous than it was before. This group has predominantly owners, this group is predominantly non-owners. So as we discussed, is this a good partition decision? And as we have discussed, yes, it is. It seems to break the group into two groups which are much more homogeneous than the original entire group because owners predominate here, non-owners predominate here. So each of these groups is very homogeneous. Okay, so now when you partition in two dimensions, we achieve the partitioning by means of drawing a line. That's what it means. And we are doing this simply because we've got two variables. We're able to plot everything on uh, plain paper. But if you have more than two dimensions, then uh, for example, if you have three dimensions, for example, you may have, let's say you've got three different dimensions for a different problem, not for the riding mowers problem. And we plot the three different dimensions on income uh, on three different axes in a three-dimensional space. Then, of course, if you make a division on education, uh, on income, for example, if you draw this plane that uh, slices the cube at an income level of 95, then what you find is that you get two regions, both of which are three-dimensional regions. And in this case, the partition is achieved by means of a plane and not a line. Of course, if you go beyond three dimensions, we cannot even look at it. But what we'll be doing is doing a partition using what is called as a hyperplane and partitioning the hyperspace into two groups. It's effectively doing the same thing. We are just working with, uh, with uh, two dimensions for clarity. Okay, so we've done one partition. But of course, our tree, as you can see, uh, as you saw earlier, consists of several levels of nodes which means that we need to do more and more partitions. That is what is called as recursive partitioning. In other words, we don't just partition once and stop because we don't, we could make this more homogeneous by putting more partitions, right? So we partition again and again and again till we cannot make it any better. That's the idea here. So that's called recursive partition. In recursive partitioning, what you do is to first select a partition. That is, you select one of the two, one of the groups that you have. Initially, you had no group, so you had no choice but to select the whole group. Now we've got two groups and we can select any one of them. Let's say we select the group at the bottom and we divide that into two once again, right? Note that we didn't divide the entire space again. In other words, the line is only within this particular partition that we selected. This line is not going all the way to the top because we selected this partition at the bottom and this line is therefore just dividing this particular partition. And this line represents, of course, partitioning on an income value of something like, whatever, 82.584, whatever this particular value is. And it says all the cases less than that value are now in this partition. All the cases greater than that value are now in this partition. Okay, or this group. So now we made... We started with one group. The first division gave us two groups. The second division gave us one extra group again. So we now have three groups. Notice once again that the, the act of partitioning created two groups which are more homogeneous than they were before. So for example, this second group here, the bottom group had 
nine non-owners and three owners. Now we made it into two groups with one group having two owners, completely homogeneous, and another group having eight non-owners and just one owner. Once again, more homogeneous. Okay, so that's the idea that every time we partition, we're going to keep making it more homogeneous. Once again, I'm aware you might be thinking this is all great, but how did you decide on which variable to partition on and where to put the partition or even which which of the two things to select? For example, I chose the bottom one. Why? Hold on a minute. We'll come to all of those things. But first, I just want you to understand what recursive, recursive partitioning is. And of course, we saw that it has a one to one correspondence with the tree. So, for example, after the first partition, this is a tree we had, assuming that this first one was on lot size, which I have not shown, I should have. And the second one now is on income. And that is what the partition has done. Okay. So, this is really what's going on. As we keep partitioning, you can see that we are actually building the tree, the same tree that we saw earlier. This is really what we are doing. 